All right. Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. So how are you liking your laptops? Come on. <laughs> Woo! Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, this session will talk about ADL.NET uh, data services. Uh, I work in a team that um, builds technology to bridge data and the web and put it together. And then a number of other people at Microsoft work at changing the names of the things I build. So, uh, so we just announced this morning, Scott uh, told the story of how we are sort of aligning all the stacks. Uh, we're actually aligning the bits, but since we're aligning the bits, we're aligning the names as well. So this is the WCF data services. And uh, some applause there, well, that's great. Uh, and um, also, you probably heard uh, I, I, another name a number of times during this conference, you heard all data or the open data protocol. And um, this is sort of an acknowledgement of the protocol taking a life of itself. And uh, you know, on one hand, we have our own implementation, servers and clients, but all the people out there are creating servers and clients and you know, different ways of using this. So we decided to give the protocol its own name. Uh, so you can think of the WCF data services as a framework to create endpoints, both ends, uh, to use the system, and the all data protocol as sort of the thing to exchange data over the web. So uh, I'll spend a little bit of time characterizing the problem space. Then I'll spend just a few slides doing, uh, like making sure we're on the same page about what we mean when we talk about REST and RESTful interfaces. And then I'll do the what's new thing, which is the title of this talk. Uh, when I when I do the what, what's new, I, I'll, it's not going to be exactly, when you say what's new, what you expect is a session where you have a list of new features that uh, some framework or something has. What I'll do is, I will do that at the end. I have the standard list of features and I'll show how cool they are and all that. But I also, I wanted to do uh, a what's new on what's happening, how, our, how we are now thinking about the open data protocol and how that's reflecting in a number of products out there. There's a whole sort of set of clients and servers and they're all speaking the same thing. So I wanted to show you concrete examples of products exchanging data with each other and all that. So why data services? What is it that we're building this thing? If you, if you think about applications you use every day in your company or at home, one of the things that is actually fairly easy to notice is uh, successful applications gather a lot of information because you know, they're successful, people use them a lot, and there is good data in there ready to, to help creating good insight. Now, just by their nature, even if it is not on purpose, those applications don't tend to be uh, that good at sharing that information with other applications that could get good uh, value out of that data. And it's not, it's not about having or not having uh, sort of an import or export interface or some web service thing. Most applications today do have that, have you know, maybe some you know, web service or maybe an export facility to export a file. But the thing is, the, the nature of the interfaces in, in applications tends to be very specific to the application itself. So there are things that speak in terms of the application's problem domain, the, the structures and the way you, you say what you want and how you get it back is very specific to each one of the applications. So it's very tricky to actually share data across systems that weren't designed together and weren't designed to exchange data together. So we call these things data silos that get formed around companies. And what we want to do is go break data silos in a way that doesn't compromise the integrity or the security of any of the individual applications, and at the same time doesn't introduce any higher coupling between applications. But uh, all that, at the same time, we want to introduce the flexibility to share data in a way that is appropriate for the various endpoints that want to work together. So in the end, breaking data silos boils down to a problem of data integration and, uh, uh, sorry, data sharing and integration. Like, these systems need to be able to exchange data, and you need to know very little about the other guys, so you, so you don't want higher coupling around them. So you can do files. Files are, I mean, for, there are certain cases where files are useful, but oftentimes they're unpractical for online applications that come together. Uh, libraries that contain APIs in them are great if you happen to have the library for your environment. Are, are you using sort of Windows or Linux or are you using you know, Manage or Native or Java or JavaScript? Like, libraries have, have limits that you reach rel relatively quickly if that's the only way to get at the other side of the data, ser uh, data set. So services are a very interesting opportunity for data integration across systems because the boundary is very well defined. And then the trick here is to find a common ground that all of these applications can share so, that, so you can enable them to get, send and receive data over this uh, service interface. So what we're trying to do is we're 
so we're, what we're saying is the center of, of, of this picture is a protocol. Uh, and you know, folks, when, when you say protocol, some folks think about these very tightly specified things where every bit has a very specific meaning and these sophisticated clients and sophisticated servers. You know, things like you know, TCP itself or maybe TDS, the SQL Server Protocol, which are fairly sophisticated uh, things. On the other hand, the protocols that make the web work are quite the opposite. They are very simple, they are stateless, and their simplicity, and in fact, the fact that they are text-based, text actually enable them to work in a variety of, way, of, of scenarios and devices and, uh, and environments. So we have consumers and producers of interesting data, and then what we're putting in the middle is the protocol. Now, uh, you'll hear me say REST a number of times, and we'll talk about the RESTful protocol. So let me characterize this REST thing first. And I'm sure you heard, heard the REST word a bunch of times. Uh, so let me tell you what it's not first. So REST is not a protocol. It's not a standard. It's not a format. So whenever somebody says, I have, I have a, my, my application supports REST, it's not clear by that statement alone what that means. Like REST is specifically an architectural style. It's a way of thinking about distributed systems. Not a, it's not a particular instance of, of a protocol or, a, or an architecture. The focus of REST is mostly around decoupling, making sure parts are independent, around scalability. Sort of the canonical example of RESTful system is the web itself. And you know, the thing sort of scales, and the people have seen that. And uh, there's a lot of focus on layering as well. If you think about uh, things like proxies and cache, or caching layers, the, the reason why they can work is because the design of things like HTTP and the web allow for intermediaries to sit between clients and servers and act on behalf of each other. Like, for example, a proxy will regularly just receive a hit from you, and it knows, because it knows the underlying interface, that it can respond, perhaps, on behalf of a server without even talking to the server. And there's no correctness problems involved. The server, the proxy, and the client understand what's going on, and then can help each other through layering. The center, central concept, or uh, one of the central concepts of, of RESTful uh, systems, is the fact that things are, data is organized in terms of resources. And resources represent the state of each one of the entities in the system you're modeling. And it's the only thing you can view from outside. There's no custom behaviors exposed outside, but, uh, like outside of the service interface. What you can see are the resources. And every resource in the system has an address. So the way you talk about a resource is you use an address, which in practice is usually a URL, and you give this URL to the system, and this is how you refer to the thing you want to talk about. In addition to the URLs, URLs allows you to say, how, what are you talking about? Now, there is, uh, you also need to say, what are you going to do with the thing you're talking about? Uh, and um, you know, it, there is many ways of modeling service interfaces. Some services uh, are more focused on exposing custom operations. So what you have is effectively a list of operations with arguments that go in and out. That's great for a certain class of scenarios. But for data sharing, it has the problem that Different systems are, cannot see, see through the meaning of those custom operations. When you have an operation that says, approve purchase order, other than a human sitting on the other side, perhaps reading the docs or inferring from the name, how can a computer figure out what's going on there? You just can't. So when it's about data sharing, what you need is a uniform interface, which is actually one of the core aspects of RESTful systems as well. A uniform interface is an interface that constrains the interaction model of a system to well-known actions. So in HTTP-based RESTful systems, it's very common to say, I can, I can do get, post, put, and delete, and that's all you can do on the system. And you model sophisticated behaviors by, uh, by sort of reacting to the state transitions as you manipulate resources. So when you change the state of a resource from one to the other, then the system understands that something is going on, and then you, you act uh, co co correspondingly based, based on that. So, if, if you bring this back to where, where I started with data, this is a very natural fit for data services. Because in the end, if we're trying to share data across systems that weren't designed together, then the key aspect here is for these systems to have a common ground, a common vocabulary of how you manipulate data. And in RESTful systems, we're saying, well, there is a way of talking about interesting units of information encapsulated as resources. There is a way of, of indicating what resource of set of resources I'm talking about through addresses through URLs. And finally, there is a well-known, understood for everybody, uniform interface. Sure, it's constrained, and that case, in this case, this is a feature, because this, was, this is what allows everybody involved in this system to uh, assume, and like, to be able to reliably assume 
a well-known meaning for each one of the actions you take on each one of the resources. So these things were just a natural fit. And uh, so from this, one thing you can infer is, oh, great. So what I can do now is I can put this resource-based REST thing something on top of my database and boom, expose it to the world. And uh, you know, in practice, very rarely, data holds on itself at that level. Data in the database has, uh, you know, the schema itself has different concerns around, you know, in principle, it should be all logical, but there is always physical aspects permeating through the logical schema. There is, you know, the arrangements of data in the database is always driven by performance requirements or, you know, uh, contention requirements and things like that. Uh, and also, there is simply business logic that does not belong to a database. It belongs to a layer higher up. So whenever you think about service interfaces to share data, don't imagine this instantly being a thing on top of a database. Imagining, imagine it as a thing on top of the corresponding business logic that introduces validation and access control and proper authentication, all of those things in the picture before the data is shared. And then, of course, at the bottom of the stack, there is going to be some kind of data repository. Yeah, if it is SQL Server, even better. We have an emotional attachment to SQL Server. But, woo! <laughs> And, uh, but, but, you know, there, there are other places where you could choose to put data if you wanted to. Uh, so uh, with that in mind, we uh, started to work on something that sort of emerged out of experience called the Open Data Protocol. Uh, and uh, I don't know, so how many of you are familiar with Astoria or data services? Great, with half of you. Um, so data services started as an effort for sharing data over RESTful systems. And this has been a couple of years now. And, you know, our, the product evolved, our thinking about the system evolved, and how we use it evolved. So now, you know, we got to a point where we took basic HTTP infrastructure, we used Atom Pub, which is a standard thing, and then we, ha we have had for a while a set of conventions on top that we use for sharing data. This got mature, we tested it a number of products, and I'll talk about this in a minute. So we decided it was time to give the, pr the protocol itself a name. And uh, so we call it the Open Data Protocol, or for short, we just call it All Data. All data is a RESTful protocol, and it runs over HTTP. So uh, the, one of the principles here is we, don't, we try very, very hard not to invent stuff. Like whenever we can use something over HTTP, we'll use that. That means all of your infrastructure still works, your proxies and firewalls and all those things work, your security systems over HTTP will continue to work, and so on. It's also, like, I'm sure this is not a word, but uh, I'm sure there is a word close enough to this. Uh, so you can poke on these systems very easily. Like, since they're just HTTP, you can open up a browser, type something in the address bar, and uh, see what comes back. So it's very easy to break the ice against any one particular system. We're talking about an integration problem. You have all these apps. So you find out about this application, and you want to know what it looks like without having to write some program or something. You just want to take a peek. Um, and it's largely based on Atom Pub. So it's effectively a layer on top. Like HTTP brings transport capabilities. It gives interaction model. It gu gives guidance to transport body and control information in headers. And then Atom, Atom itself introduces a format. And Atom Pub introduces things like collections and links and things like that. We were missing things on top of that. So we took Atom Pub and did some extensions on top. Atom Pub itself is designed to be extensive, ex extended all over the place. So this was sort of a very natural fit for uh, natural fit for Atom Pub. So the first thing we did is we preserved, of course, the Atom serialization of Atom Pub, but we also introduced a JSON serialization that is useful in context where you, especially in JavaScript, where you, it's more natural to parse uh, a JSON piece of text than it would be to, to parse XML. So uh, let me stop here, and you know, this is kind of an abstract thing so far. I mean, all data, what does that mean? So let, let me actually switch to uh, my demo computer, and let's poke a little bit over a couple of these services and see what they look like. Um, I'll build services later. For now, I have one already here. Uh, so I'll just run it. Um, so I have, so this is a open data serv protocol service. And when I hit the root of these services, what I get is what's called an Atom service document. A service document is literally the start of a graph that is all hyperlinked together. So you get this thing, and you get a set of collections that have a name, and I have a URL. If you look at this guy, it's an href. And uh, the reason why it's short is because it's relative to the base that is up here. But effectively, you, it starts here, and then you can jump links. And as you jump links, you can navigate your, all, your entire resource set. In this case, this example is a product catalog. So I can go here and, for example, follow the link to products, which is kind of small, but this is, this is the URL I'm hitting. And uh, when it comes back, what I get is an Atom field. 
And actually, let me, let me do this real quick so I can show you a feed in feed form. <clears throat> and you know, an atom feed is a thing that has, you know, the browser knows about, so it knows how to render it, and it has a title, it has a date, and it has a, or an updated date. It has uh, some summary. In this case, since a product catalog, I put the price there. So it's a, way, it's a common, simple way of exchanging information. Now, uh, let me change back. If you want to pick inside, we can actually look at the XML of this thing. And in this case, it's a feed of products. So what we get is a feed element, which is a sequence of entry elements. Each entry contains the data about the product, and there is a structured data. This is one of the parts that AtomPub really doesn't say anything about how to encode the structured data. It says the content goes here. So we chose a way of encoding structured data. Um, it also has a, a URL. As I said before, every resource in the system has a URL that identifies it. So I can like, come here, copy that guy, or any one of them, I'll use a different ID. And uh, yeah, you can ignore for now the URL syntax. I'll get back to that later. And this time, I got an entry back. I didn't get a feed because I'm addressing a particular resource. Um, and um, so as I talked about, this is doing gets, which is the, what the browser does. But of course, you can do put, post, and delete to transform the state of the system. And I, I'll, I'll get into more details about that in a second. So um, great. So we have a. We have a REST URL, uh, RESTful interface that you put URLs in, you get data back. One of the things that the, these systems do, actually, let's get back to this URL, is uh, support multiple formats. I said we support an XML-based format, which is this Atom uh, thing, and we also support JSON. The way we do this is using standard content type negotiation, which is just an HTTP thing. So I'll use Fiddler. Fiddler, for those of you that haven't seen it, is an HTTP debugger. If you do anything with HTTP, this is your friend. Um, so I'll just paste the URL there. I need to change my host name to an IPv4 address. So let's do that. So when I do that, I do a get. And if you see the response, whoops, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> Let me do this first. Um, the response is some a bunch of response headers, and then the content, which is the Atom entry. If I wanted uh, um, JSON instead, I can, I can use the accept header that tells the other system what representations of this resource I'm ready to, to understand. If you don't say anything, we give, you, we give you Atom. So if here I say application slash JSON, hit execute, I get the same response, except now I have sort of curly braces instead of angle brackets. The difference is just a little bit more elaborate than that. But it, you, know, you, can, you can tell the difference here. Um, so doing it this way is important because it means different systems can exchange URLs that point at inter important pieces of information independently of the representation that each one of these systems expect for it. So the, the resource itself is not what you have in angle brackets or, or, or curly braces. It's the, the abstract concept of this piece of information. And then you get these projections, these representations, and each one gets to choose the one that is appropriate. So for example, let's go back here. And um, I, I'll, most of the rest of the presentation in the demos, I'll use the XML rep. So let me use an example of the JSON representation here. If I'm in a browser, most likely what I want to do is get some objects uh, or get some data, turn it into JavaScript objects, and then manipulate them on, on my program. And for that, JSON is a great format. Browsers have native support for it, so it makes things straightforward. So let's do some of that. I have a standard HTML page. The only thing I did is I put a, so the jQuery library. Those of you who know it, it's like once you go jQuery, you know, there's no coming back. Uh, so, and uh, I have a, I have a JavaScript file with all the boring parts that you don't want to miss. Uh, you don't want to see me typing. So what I want to do is, uh, when the page starts, I want to let me show you the page uh, how it looks like right now. Uh, so I want to type a URL here, click here, and see the output. Now yeah, we're not going for the fancy stuff here. Um, so uh, so what I'll, what I'll say is uh, on the document. When you're ready, which means all the DOM is actually usable, call this function. And then what I want to do inside this thing is uh, I want to react to the click of the load button down here. So I'm going to go find the, the element called load. And I, I want to handle the click event. And I, I'm telling you, this pattern is addictive. You can go in and in all day. Uh, so what I want to do now is actually do something. So uh, let's. Um, 
So what I want to do is I want to go get the URL and get the object from the server, and I want to get it in JSON. So jQuery and most of these scripting libraries already has support, simplified support for interacting with, uh, with resources over HTTP. So in this case, I'll, do the get, I'll use the getJSON method. The getJSON method takes a URL. So here we want the URL the user typed in the, in the input box. So this is called URL. And I'll call value to get the actual value. And then this calls a function one, once we hear back from the server, and the data parameter contains the actual data. So uh, here I can do something like not fancy, like alert data. And let's, uh, let's see how, how well we're doing so far. I'll hit refresh here. And um, uh, we had our URL was catalog.service, which was what we were just using. And then we, can, we were playing around with products. So I'll just say products. And we get back an object. The thing is, uh, most of these frameworks, they get the text from the server. And when you tell them you're going to do JSON, they already turn it into objects for you. So it's really, really simple. Like the answer is not even text, it's just this JavaScript objects. So you're ready to, for you to do stuff. Um, so uh, what I want to do now is I want to render this on the screen. So in, in this demo file, all I have, I have a function that takes an array and renders a table, so not, nothing fancy. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just call that. So this is called demo.render something. And this takes the element against, uh, to render this thing, which in this case is called output, and the actual data. Now, if you look at what the shape of the response is, uh, maybe we have it in Fiddler. Um, so data always has a, a top-level D element, and this is for security reasons. You don't want to return top-level arrays uh, on a browser because there is certain sort of attack vectors that leverage that. Um, so you always want a top-level wrapper. Uh, and the other thing is, some, depending on whether or not we need to put multiple pieces of information, we give you the array inside uh, data, or we give you an object that contains control information and the array. So JavaScript is uh, very handy for these things. So I can say uh, either the result, or if the result is not defined, it must be right in D. Uh, effectively, one of these two things is going to be the array. So let's uh, go back to the browser, hit a five, and now if I say catalog.svc slash products, <clears throat> I get you know, a table of products. So very, very simple stuff. And being simple is the key feature here. The moment we get fancy, the assumptions about systems talking to each other breaks, breaks down very quickly. Uh, so here I can, you know, I had the other thing we had was categories. Whoops, that's not gonna work. There, and boom, I have the categories. So simple stuff, but it's very, very effective. Go back to the deck. So we talked then about simple addressing schemes, representations, content type negotiation, and XML and JSON formats. So in general, in most RESTful systems, URLs are considered opaque. And this is a feature. By consider them, considering them opaque things, you reduce the overall coupling between the layers, because one layer does not need to know the syntax or pattern that the other, the other side uses to produce URLs. So, uh, in, in the open data protocol, we give you the choice. The whole system is hyperlinked. So you can grab an entity and then jump or a resource and navigate links and jump through them without ever knowing what the URL format is. On the other hand, if you're willing to pay the trade-off of, of, take, of, of taking and knowing the URL format, then you can leverage the fact that we have a well-known predictable convention for URLs. So the idea is, based on metadata, uh, that describes the structure of the system and the structure of each one of the resource types that we handle on any particular service, you can predict what the shape of any URL is going to be. So you can formulate, literally, queries using URLs instead of some funky syntax. And this is actually extremely powerful, because URLs, just like everything else, uh, that we're trying to not invent stuff, URLs work like naturally flow through things. They, you can pass over a proxy, you can, you know, most systems will just take a URL and get your resource back. Even the browser works great over URLs. So this is very valuable for us. Now let me show you uh, like what these two things look like in, uh, in concrete terms. So the metadata system is as more, mo as, whoops, catalog. Um, as most things in the open data protocol, the metadata interface is optional. So if you don't want to have metadata, then clients will do it their best to infer whatever you, the shape of the system is. But if you have metadata, we can do very, very nice things for you. And I'll, I'll show you some examples later. So there is a magic URL. Let me zoom into this thing. Uh, the key part here is dollar metadata after the, 
the root of the service. And when you get that, what we serve is a, is a document, it's a bunch of angle brackets, just a metadata document, that has two key elements. It has all, actually three. It has all the types. So each res every resource in the system is of a particular type. And the type tells you what is the shape of the, the structure of the resource. Then it has associations. Associations become links. You know, these, these, these systems, in the end, are resources with hyperlinks across, uh, like between each other. And associations let you predict where the links are going to show up. And finally, there is a container that has all the actual collections. So I know there is a categories collection and a product collections. These are the instances of the system. The actual format is not only is boring and interesting, we have APIs on top. So you don't need, you don't need to worry about the actual uh, XML format a lot. Now, now that we know the shape of our system, we can construct URLs that do interesting things for us, especially if you're presenting information. Uh, so for example, here, uh, I have categories. And um, I know that categories has a navigation property called products, which retur returns all the products for that particular category. So uh, if I type slash products here, I get only the subset of products for this category, which in this case is like mountain bikes or something. Uh, if I change it to something else, then I'll get you know, road bikes. The thing is, uh, so I, I can predict how URLs are going to sort of work for me only based on looking at the metadata. The other thing that uh, you can do with URLs is um, you can, if you have a set, you can manipulate the set. So let's do products. And you can do simple things, like for example, you can have a filter that says, uh, I only want the products where the color is red. And uh, you could just get the red product. So you know, nothing fancy. You can do and, ors, and substring, you know, a couple of very simple things. You have a question? That, that's a function of the service. That's implemented in the service itself. Yeah, the, the question is, is that implemented in the service? Yeah, yeah. So my little client thing is not doing really anything here. I could, I'm, I'm doing this here so you guys can read it. But uh, if I paste the same URL here, you'll, you'll whoa. What the, oh, I didn't put the, the prefix. It was bikes, there's that SVC, and let me get the second part of these. It's not bikes, it's catalog. There, so you're gonna have to trust me that they are all red, I'm gonna show you one. That sample must be right, right? So, uh, so yeah, I mean, the, no, no, none of I'm sh what I'm showing has to do with the little app. The little app I just built, just that's what I wrote. The, the function I called just renders the table. Um, so. Uh, we can also sort stuff. We can say, well, of those, I want them sorted by list price, and I get them sorted with the cheapest one at the top. I can say the sending to do the highest one. And you know, the usual stuff that you would expect, composite sorting, up, down, all that. Uh, there is also a simple paging construct, so you can page over result sets. Give me, uh, skip 20, give me the next 10. This is also handy when you want to limit the result set. I can say top three, and I get only three of them. And then there is an important construct called expand. What happens on these systems is the system is hyperlinked, and you want to leverage this hyperlinking in the system. So one thing you can do is instead of lazily following links, you can eagerly follow them if you know they're going to be there. For example, in this case, we know every product has a category. So here I can say expand the category navigation property. And uh, when I get this, I get the products. But I also, I mean, the renderer knows how to render this, but you can, this is the same in XML, just harder to follow. Uh, and if I expand this, I get all the information of the category here. And uh, the same thing works the other way around. If I find, if I query for categories, and um, for each category I say expand products, then I get the categories. And in this case, the related set is a set. It's not a singleton. So I don't get one row. I get actually a, a set of related rows. In the wire, they just look nested one inside the other XML. So you can, and you can have multiple of these. So you can paint a whole graph and fetch it in, in one go from the server. This is very, very expressive when you're trying to get a data on the client without doing multiple round trips. Uh, all right. <clears throat> so we talked about addressing, we talked about metadata. Uh, now, so, so far this is like a description of an abstract thing, not clear where it lives. So let's talk implementation. Let's talk about what does it speak this protocol today and you can go use. So I'm going to start with the server side. And I, I'll start with a list of things that you know, I picked the ones you'll probably recognize. And, and uh, they were, for the most part, discussed here at, at PDC09. So the first one is, of course, .NET itself. And I'll spend time on this one. So you can create servers using the .NET framework. And we actually make it easy for you to do that. Uh, we also support SharePoint. And I'll talk about this in a second. 
reporting services in the new version of SQL. The table storage in Azure uses the same interface. Dallas, you saw Dallas in the keynote. It's a natural fit, you know, a bunch of data sets on the cloud. What, I mean, what are you going to use at the interface? Media Room, OGDI, there's a bunch of uh, systems already, uh, already there that use this interface. So let me actually sample through a couple of them. So the first one I'm going to do is I'll actually build uh, a little service so you can see how we start from scratch. Uh, so there's a number of options for data sources to input data into the data services framework. And I'll discuss the details of how you hook up custom sources later. For now, I'll do the easy one. We have this, uh, this sort of straightforward path where if your data is in a relational database, again, if it is SQL, even better, then you can put the entity framework on top, put a st the Astoria runtime on top of the entity framework, and boom, you have a working system. Uh, so what I have here is I have a, a uh, entity data model I, I already created. For those of you not familiar with the entity framework, you can create one of these just by doing file new ad.net entity data model and then tweaking the mapping uh, to the database. In this case, I pre-created it just for in the interest of time. Um, so what I want to do here is I'll actually create a service that is more or less a clone of the one we already had, so you can actually see how I got to that state. So let me come here, and I'll choose ADO.NET Data Service. Of course, we have to go rename that. It'll be called WCF Data Service now. And uh, I'll just call this catalog 2, uh, in an, uh, showing complete lack of imagination. Uh, so, and uh, so what the template does is, so it sets up a service, and what you have to do is it in indicates where you, where, like the place where you put the data, where the data comes from. So in the end, the, the system exposes a RESTful interface over the data set, but it doesn't know where you're getting your data from. So here you can put a number of things. What I, the one I'm going to use right now is I'll give it an entity framework generated class, and the system knows how to go from there. So this is called uh, bikes. This is a, this is a bike shop database, so it's called bikes entities. By default, the system is locked down. So what I'll do here is I'll open it up and I'll say categories. Maybe it's uh, read-only, so you can query but not update. And uh, we have the products set, which will re make it read-write. You can configure your own things here. And uh, of course, at this point, everybody gets uniform access to these particular sets I enabled. But I may have business rules that control who gets to see what. So let me give you an example of that. Um, I'm going to use a construct called a query interceptor. The idea of interceptors is, as I mentioned before, one of the key aspects of RESTful systems is to have a uniform interface that is pre-constrained and predefined. So we can't really introduce custom methods because that would break the abstraction and now you're back into the business of figuring out what the methods mean. So instead, what we do is we say, no, look, so we're going inter to interact through the, uni through the standard interface that gets put, posts, and deletes, and you know, options, just a few, a few uh, verbs. And then there's an interception model that allows you to catch things as they happened and customize the behavior. So you're not introducing custom entry points. You're controlling the, the, the state as it goes out of the system or as, as it comes into the system. In this case, I'll, I'll do one for categories. So I'll say, what this means is whenever somebody gets something from categories, regardless of which URL they used to land there, then apply this rule. Uh, the signature for this is really weird, but it grows on you, don't worry. Uh, so what you need to return is a, is a predicate. In this case, the predicate, predicate goes from category to Boolean. Uh, I'm, going, I'm going to call this on query categories. And what I need to do here is return a function that given a category, tells us whether or not we should include this on the set, on the response. So um, in this case, I'll, I'll have a very simple rule. If you are logged in, I'll show you everything. If you're not logged in, I'm only going to show you those categories that are public. And there is a public flag in the category. So uh, first, I need to know, uh, find out if you're logged in. So I'll do context.current.user.identity.authenticated. You don't remember the whole thing. Um, and then, so what I'll do here is I'll return uh, a predicate, fun a predicate lambda that says, given a category, either you're authenticated or the category has this public bit set. And the way we evaluate this is the data services runtime turns URLs into link queries. And this is a, a, like very natural, uh, a very natural fit for layering, because then we can take any data source that has a link provider and, and sort of layer the RESTful interface on top and have the full URL convention. So effectively, all we do in the runtime from the URL translation perspective is we take the URL, turn it into a link query, and then we 
just submit it for the, under, for the next layer down to execute. So this just injects predicates into those link queries. So the cool thing about this is this predicate is evaluated at the data source. So if this is a relational database, this query makes it as part of the bigger query into the database, and no extra data travels back into the client. So it's a very effective way, and actually a very efficient way, of building access control. Of course, I'm doing something kind of trivial here, but just to give you an example of something more elaborate, imagine for a second you have, you obtain the user using the same context, dot identity, dot name, or whatever. And you want to do access control, like uh, row level access control. You could do something where you have the categories table and then a users table that is a link table between the categories and the users, right? And then for everyone you want access, you just add a row there. And if you don't have a row there, you can't see it. Well, you could write something that says, well, given a category, uh, I already have the relationship between categories and users, and I'm saying if any of the users is such that the user name is the user that is logged in, then this is good. So this one-liner plus proper schema in the database gives you complete row-level security for this particular set. And you can repeat this on all the sets in your system. So you can build fairly sophisticated access control systems. And the cool thing is, at the top, all you see is slash categories. So not, none of the access control stuff permeates through the RESTful interface. It stays properly sort of isolated behind the service interface. So for now, I'll simplify this and just leave it at that. And the one thing I'll do for completeness is, I also have products. And the rule I'm going to invent for products is you can see the products for which you can see their categories. So this is the product thing. And here I'll say product as well. So I'll say either you're authenticated or the category for the, the product is public. So I can do a little join there. It just lo doesn't look like a join because um, Entity Framework is helping us a little bit. So uh, let's compile this. And now if I go take a peek here, let's say view in browser. This is catalog two, the new service we created. It should be here. And boom, so there you go. So I, I have my service document. I can say slash products or slash categories. And I'll see the ones that I want to see. I'm not going to see the ones I don't. So I already have a fully functional uh, uh, open data protocol server. So uh, in this case, what I did is I built, a I mean, as a developer, I built my own custom server. And if you're writing your application, you can imagine doing this so you can expose your data to other systems. And in a minute, when I talk about clients, I'll sort of talk about the motivations why you would do this. Now, uh, before I move to the client, I want to talk about another server. Um, so I mentioned in the list I had before, I mentioned SharePoint. Starting on SharePoint 2010, every SharePoint site is an open data server out of the box. You just need to install the Astoria runtime on it. And you can, you know, we just announced the beta, you can download it and give it a shot today. So what I have here is a SharePoint site. It's a SharePoint 2010 site. And uh, I have a couple of lists. I have a list of projects and a list of employees. So now what I can do, starting on this version, is I can take this URL and go to the magic spot VTI bin, the list data SVC. And again, when I hit the root of this thing, I get a service document where each one of the elements here is a SharePoint list. And I can take, so let's say I have employees here. So I can come here and simply say slash employees. And let me zoom in so you can see the URL is effectively up to here is the service root. And then the rest from here on down is the, the open data protocol convention. Uh, if I say slash employees, boom, I get a feed with the employees. So very, very straightforward. So this means that if I were, say, in my little, where is it? Uh, let's just type it. So if I had my uh, HTML page where we, that we were playing around before, if I paste my URL here, IE complains because I'm going cross domain. But if I let it go, I actually, I actually don't get anything. Uh, let's try again. <clears throat> Let's make it bigger. Oh, there. Yeah. It's thinking. I don't think it's thinking. Let's do this. Hmm. Let's try projects. Yeah. Oh, I know. I got the name wrong here, I'm sure. This results. What are the chances? Mm. Let's see. 
I don't need that guy. Oh, there you go. Woof. Uh, so the so this is I mean I didn't write I mean other than the screw up with the name I didn't change anything. I mean this is the same little trivial client uh, that's just some JSON get and boom now I'm I'm accessing data from <clears throat> from SharePoint. So all that data was locked down in SharePoint. SharePoint is a great example of a successful product. A bunch of data goes into SharePoint, and now you want to make the best out of it. So now you have very, very simple means to go get at that data. So I have more examples about uh, servers later once we talk about clients. But I want to highlight one particular thing, which is low barrier of entry. The key to these systems to go well and to be effective is to keep the barrier of entry for interoperability as low as it gets. So as a client and as a server, you want to be as fancy as you can so people can get the most out of your data. But you don't want to require everybody else to be fancy. You want to require everybody else to do the minimum possible so you actually can get interoperability. And to drive this particular point home, let me give you one example. So SharePoint, you know, we have web services. We have a bunch of options to code against SharePoint. But in the end, like, by creating this RESTful interface, we want to get, nail this point about low barrier of entry. So let me give you an example that uh, probably highlights this the best. So I have my list of employees here. What I want to do now is I want to create a new employee. And I, what I'll do is uh, I'll use a tool called curl. Curl is a command line HTTP client that actually is like the Windows builds are actually weird. They are in some other random platforms. So it's as low of a barrier of entry as it gets because it's just a plain HTTP thing. So let's do that. So I'm going to go here, copy the URL for employees. And uh, remember, employee has a full name and a job title. We'll do those two. So I'm going to say curl, and I'll tell the system that it's secure with NTLM, so please log in with my current user. I'll add a header that is the content type header and tell the system that I want JSON, which is the format I'm going to use. And then I'll give it a full name of demo and a job title of SDE, which is Microsoft Lingo for Developer. Uh, and um, I'll tell the system to do a post. And finally, I'll give it this as the URL I want to post to. So if I hit this guy, I get a replay from the server telling me what, what I did. And if I come back here and hit a 5, I have a demo thing here. So as low as it gets as a barrier of entry. Now, thank you. So the other thing that I want to also highlight is this is not an insert into SharePoint's database. This is an insert into the SharePoint system. Full business logic run here. You can see that the system knows who I am and recorded that I modified this. If I had constraints on the columns or access control over the list, that would have kicked in. And if I didn't have permission, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't have been able to actually insert the thing. So full business logic is running, but in, at the top, I get this flexible, simple data-centric system. <coughs> OK, so we talked about servers and barriers of entry on the server. Let's talk clients. So the simple rule is if you have an HTTP stack, you're good. You can talk to the system. We don't have any other requirements than that. From there on, the only question is how much code you want to write or you want us to write. And you know, the more you hire up in the stack, we'll introduce abstractions for you so you write less, at the, you know, usually at the cost of well, having the abstraction in the middle. But uh, other than that, any environment you can connect over HTTP, you're good. So uh, sampling of, of client stacks that we have we have Excel, so if you're an information worker or a developer that doesn't feel like coding for that one day, you can just use Excel, and I'll show that in a second. And then we have client stacks for a number of platforms. Visual Studio knows about the OData protocol. Then the .NET framework and Silverlight and Ajax, uh, as in the Microsoft Ajax toolkit, and PHP and Java, we have actually toolkits for all of these things. And in fact, the PHP and the Java ones are, are open source, so you can download them, look at the source, you can change them to make them fit your needs and so on. So let me now come back here and uh, show you what the client experience looks like. Um, so first thing is, I said Visual Studio knows about this. What did I mean? So what I mean is, I have a, a, a WPF client here. Uh, and it could, be, and it could be a Silverlight client, a WinForms client, whatever. And I can now say add service reference and give a URL to any open data server that exposes metadata. For this one, we do require metadata. Otherwise, you can just use the client without the code generation. In this case, what I'll do is I'll actually, just to cross uh, scenarios and not use my own server, I'll just give us a URL to my SharePoint server. And when I hit go, the system discovers metadata over the SharePoint server. I'll call this team site service. 
And uh, what we do is we go fetch the metadata and generate code. So now you have a client ready to go uh, with all types for each one of the resource types, and you have a typed experience that is very natural for Visual Studio. So for example, I already have a, I have a screen with a grid, and that's, that's all I did from the UI perspective. So let me do this thing. I'll say catalog client dot team site, and let's make this client get some data from SharePoint. I'll create the team data context equals new one of these. I'll give it a URI to my service. And now, uh, so the service uh, is behind NTLM authentication. So I'll say credentials equals credential cache dot default credentials. And what I want to say basically is items, whoops, grid dot item source equals, and you can see that for each one of the SharePoint lists, we create a strong type entry point. We don't even know this is SharePoint. This could be my own service. It could be a Dallas endpoint out on the web. It doesn't matter. It's anything that exposed the, the metadata to describe the system. If I say two list, whoops, not the string. If I say two list here and run this thing, let's see if I hopefully I run the right thing. Looks like I did. Boom, I have a client pointing to, to to SharePoint. Like, and again, the idea here is very, very simple stuff. And then we layer uh, interesting things on top. Like, for example, one of the great things that we have here is, you know, you're not going to want always the entire content of the list. You, you want to pick and choose what you want. So we actually have full support for link queries over this. So you can write something like from EM in service.employees, where the employee uh, has a job title of SDE, ordered by uh, the full name of the employee, select that guy, not that. Um, and then here I can go like query that to string. And if I run this version of the system, now I'll get like a subset of the, of the employees. The important thing is uh, there's no magic under the covers. Uh, so if I, let's do this real quick. So if I run the application under the debugger, and uh, so we hit this breakpoint, if I now, come here and do just a, a two string of Q. Let me zoom this in. You can see that all we did is we actually turned the link query into a URL. So we actually wrote a like, link translator for URLs. And so you can write a link query. And as long as we can actually translate it, we'll turn it into a URL and send an HTTP get. So there's no magic under the covers. This is like Visual Studio working well with open data servers of any kind. <clears throat> um, all right. So talked about servers, talked about clients. There is also third parties that are starting to pick this up. For example, the IBM folks uh, added support for this in, in uh, WebSphere Extreme Scale, which means you can actually do the exact same thing I just did against uh, a, web, a WebSphere you know, cache cluster. There's companies like DB4O, which build a database, or Telerik, which builds a number of solutions for developers that built, uh, using, mostly using the Astoria runtime, uh, solutions that integrate their software and the open data protocol just out of the box. So uh, we, you know, as we evolved over this, like we started with this a couple of years ago, and as products evolved uh, using this, we learned about a bunch of things that we had to do in order for this to really, really be useful. So um, a few examples of this is, one is so far I talked about the structured data. Uh, the reality is that very often you need blobs support, like large objects. A simple example is SharePoint. One of the most important things in SharePoint is their document libraries. And you don't want a separate interface for that. Similarly, there is blobs in, you know, in other places. There is oftentimes you may want to manage pictures. So we, it turns out that AtomPub has first class support for this through something called media link entries. So we fully just embraced that. We didn't really invent anything at all, except that we, our clients and servers know how to expose and consume these things. So you can not only expose structured data, you can also export, expose blobs. And if you're using our runtime, we have interfaces you can implement to expose this data outside. Um, we also have a new query options. In particular, so they're, they're in two categories. One is a simple thing people hated us because we didn't do it, which was count. Everybody, like, everybody needed this, um, and uh, you know, we misestimated how passionate people were about this. So given any set, there is a segment at the end now called dollar $count. So it's that simple, this tiny little feature. And if you get that, you get the count. So very straightforward. But every, it turns out that everybody wanted this, because you need it for proper paging, so you know how many rows you have and all that. 
Uh, there is also an option to get the first page and the, count, the total count in a single go, so you don't have to do two round trips to find this out. The other thing we did was projections. Uh, what projections means is you get to choose what parts of the, of, like, you get to vertically slice the result set. So I can here say, for example, select full name, job title, and I get less data. And this actually works through expands. So you can expand, and then on each one of the expansion segments, you can narrow down the columns that you want. So you can paint exactly the graph you want and fetch that into the client you know, in one go. And uh, so the syntax in the URL is just select. The link translator is fully integrated with this. So you can now, on the client, just write select statements and project into an anonymous type or a custom type and get the right shape. And you know, our materializer knows about this, so it, it's just a fancier link query, and we actually taught the link translator a lot of tricks that build on top of this. So now you're able to write a lot more queries than you were able to write the last version. <clears throat> uh, so feed customization. Before our feeds were, I mean, they were legal atom feeds, but they didn't look good. And it's useful to be able to see the, view, the feed in a feed viewer and see the titles and stuff. So we introduced mapping capabilities so you get to, to choose how to expose uh, the feeds as proper feeds, in addition to including the data. And you can do this declaratively. You just tell us the mapping between the standard elements and the elements on, on your data set, and we'll construct the feeds the right way. Uh, we also have a throttling mechanism. You, know, you don't want to say slash employees or products and return a million rows. On the other hand, you don't want to have methods that constrain how many things you get, because now you need to know the meaning of a method. So what we do is we have this thing called server-driven paging. That, uh, what it does is, uh, Effectively, you say how many rows, and when we reach that limit, we just give you a URL that continues. And then you keep giving this next link URL, these are continuation URLs, and, uh, until you, and you keep following them until you're done. When there's no URL, you're done with the set. So very, very simple, but uh, it actually solves the problem very cleanly. And this is part of the Atom standard as well. Um, so I mentioned before that uh, there's a number of options if you're using the, the data services runtime to bring data into the system. The example I used today uses a relational database, the entity framework, and then the provider that is built into a system. This is what I call like the piece of cake scenario, and you know, it, it's pretty straightforward to put together. If what you have is some custom store, and you have a link provider for it, and you don't want full control, you, you want to type your classes as .NET objects and then give us a link implementation for the actual query part, then you can just type your classes in .NET, give us a link provider, and we'll do a REST. We'll infer metadata automatically from using reflection from your types and build the service. If you need full control over the thing, you can write a custom provider. There is a bunch of interfaces. There are some required, and then there is a number of optional ones that you can implement, and uh, you can create a data source out of anything you want. For example, this is what SharePoint and Azure Table Service uses. They have their own custom providers. They use the same bits you get. So we actually packaged all the things we learned working with them and actually put them on the release we're shipping now. So you get the exact same thing. Um, and you can implement something that doesn't even use .NET types. Maybe your schema is dynamic, or the metadata is stored in a database. And you, know, you can construct the, system, the metadata of the system in any way you want, and we'll expose it, and we'll enforce the format, the interaction model, URLs, and all of that for you. On the client side, one of the first things we did, like the coolest things we did is we did visualization. The problem with these systems is if it is a database, what's underneath, maybe you know the shape of it because you looked at the metadata of the database itself. But if it is a random service out there, how do you know what is in there for you to go explore and query? So this is another example of no magic under the covers, just exchanging the XML document, but then building services on top. So before, I added a, service, a reference here to my SharePoint site. Uh, if I go to any data service reference to any of these things, I can say view in diagram. And what this does is takes the metadata, and with the metadata exposes the schema of my system visually. So I can see all the entity types or the resource types and the relationships. So I can you know, navigate through the system. Since, since we have metadata, we can even search over the metadata. And uh, you know, I'll find the item, look it up here. We can even use relationships to explore the system. For example, here I can say, remove all but the one I selected, and then I can say, bring all the related items. And uh, basically, I'm, I'm having a, this rich exploration exercise over the data set without having any clue of what this data set is. 
Like, in fact, I can come here and add a reference to like, some random website out there and have the same experience. And once I'm done and I know what I, I find what I'm looking for, I can do right click, view in browser, and boom, you know, pokeability kicks in, and I can just use a get and see what the service looks like or the data in the service looks like. So very, very simple. Um, so the other thing around sort of putting things together is not only I can visualize in Visual Studio, but I can also visualize in, 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 as an information worker without Visual Studio, without having to write code. So uh, what I have here is Excel 2010 and Power Pivot, which is a, 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 like we, something we shipped as part of SQL Server that helps uh, information worker do business intelligence over data from all sources. So in this case, of course, we can get data from a database. Uh, the problem in practice is that very rarely you have straight access to a database. And even if you did, that data may not be appropriate because, again, you're skipping the middle, the middle layer, the business logic. This guy can actually load from feeds as well. So I can actually say, get data from a feed, come to the, the catalog, remember, that we built before, catalog two. This is the system I built from scratch a minute ago. Give it to Power Pivot and say, go figure out what's in there. And uh, so it will, again, discover the metadata in the system and say, you have categories and products, you want any? You can say, yeah, sure, I mean, products in this case. And uh, so Power Pivot will go pull the, the feed as an open data feed and uh, load it straight into Power Pivot. I can prepare it here, and once it's ready, I can just load it up into, into Excel. Um, Similarly, I can actually, if I want data, say, from my application, and I want to correlate it with data from SharePoint, I can give the URL to SharePoint that I was using a second ago, click Next, and the same discovery mechanism kicks in. The system on the client doesn't even know it's SharePoint. And uh, I can find my employees collection, <clears throat> click Finish, and uh, now I have something from SharePoint and something from my custom application ready to do like an Excel client-side mashup thingy just out of the box. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, and to wrap this up, because we're running out of time, so a similar thing we did with, uh, with reporting services. So every report in reporting services, once you upgrade to the new version of SQL Server, has, it exposes the data behind the report as a feed. Not the raw data, but the computed data. So whenever you have a chart or a table or anything, you can say, I want the data underneath that. And I don't want to screen scrape the report, which actually happens surprisingly often. I, you know, I didn't find out that, about this until we got into this topic. So this little button here actually does that. You click that, we expose the data as a feed, and you can load it into Excel, you can load it into your, your own application. So literally, you can use uh, reports as a way of exposing the data. So wrapping up. So, uh, I wanted to touch on this really quickly. We did, on the client, we also did great data binding work. You should check it out. And uh, we talked the link, the link translator to keep up with that. We did cross-domain access, which was very important for, uh, for Silverlight to be able to use Silverlight across, with data across domains. And we kept up with all the changes in the protocol. So all I showed you runs on Visual Studio 2010, and we're also backporting it to 3.5 SP1, so you can use it in 3.5 SP1-based systems. Um, and with that roadmap from here, we want to see the open data protocol everywhere. We're working with Windows Live to see it there as well. And we're also working hard on deep WCF integration. So my call to action here is, if you have any data set that is cool, that's interesting to expose, look at the open data protocol, put it there. You'll get instance value because you'll get all these clients, developer and information worker clients out of the box. And if you have interesting tools on the client, if you understand the open data protocol, all of these data sources will be immediately available to you to consume and get the most out of the data and give value to your tools as well. So with that, I want to thank you very much for staying here today. <laughs> <laughs>